My favorite painting of all time is titled Blue Monday by Annie Lee. The painting depicts a thin black woman hunched over her bed, her legs wide apart and shoulders crunched together. She looks disgruntled, frayed, and worn down. Deep, eerie blues are the main color of the painting, cutting every inch of the carpet, the bedsheets, and the walls, whose dark blue streaks loom over her in the background. A closer look will show that it's currently 5 in the morning, and it is indeed a Monday. But it's not just any Monday. It's the very first Monday of the month, showing a long list of blank days ahead that will inevitably have to be faced, just as this one does. As an artist, Lee was a national icon in the black artist community of the 90s and 2000s. Her work was especially beloved for her honest depictions of black culture and particularly of black womanhood, with many of her paintings featuring depictions of black women that were rarely ever seen in other forms of mainstream media. Her art style was immediately recognizable for her choice to depict her figures without any facial features, instead opting to convey the essence of a subject through color, clothing detail, and body language. Lee's Blue Monday was directly inspired by her experience as a railroad worker and being forced to wake up early morning in order to prepare for work. She would get up at 5 a.m., slave away at a hard shift, and then come home and make art. Incidentally, art was the one refuge she had away from the pains of her job. When I look at this painting, I don't just see a woman who's tired or exhausted or who just isn't feeling it today. No, when I look at this painting, I see a black woman who is experiencing pure, unadulterated dread. I see doom and pain and misery. I see extreme fatigue, the kind where you're so drained that you can barely even recognize your own thoughts. I see a body and a spirit that is so beaten down that even just staring at this painting for too long is sometimes too much for me to bear. In this painting, I see a woman who is dreading having to rise and go to work. Many of the reasons why are obvious. It's 5am and she's clearly exhausted. Of course she wants to stay in bed and rest. But I'm willing to bet that another source of her dread is the job itself. Knowing how hard it's going to be, how long it's going to be, knowing how beaten down she'll be by the end of the day, and knowing that she'll have to wake up again the next morning to do it all over again. In many ways, I am almost certainly projecting my own personal experiences onto this painting. Annie Lee herself lived a very hard and tragic life having lost two husbands to cancer by only age 40 and having had one of her sons be killed in a car accident. She was also the mother of a young girl at the time of this painting, and surely a lot of her own exhaustion came from having to raise a child in the midst of her mourning. It's likely that the pain that Lee put into this painting was a pain sourced from many different angles, including a grief and tragedy that I've been privileged enough to never have to experience in my own life. But having first laid eyes on this painting back in 2018, I found that I'd never related harder to any other piece of art in my entire life. I look at this painting, and I see myself. I see a black woman up in the deep, early hours of the morning, exhausted and sore and full of misery. I see a woman who knows she has to get ready for work, but whose body and mind are begging her not to, begging her not to leave the safety and protection of her room. I look at this painting and I see a woman whose entire soul is filled with dread for the day that she's about to endure. Last year, a week before my 23rd birthday, I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder along with a number of other mental illnesses and neurological disorders. PTSD is defined as a condition of persistent mental or emotional stress occurring as a result of injury or severe psychological shock. In other words, PTSD is when your brain and body have perpetual severe reactions to a traumatic event even long after the event has passed. My psychiatrist went over my results with me and explained that my primary PTSD symptoms were hypervigilance, dissociation, depersonalization, and intrusive thoughts. Hypervigilance is when you have an extreme alertness to your surroundings, almost like a kind of a paranoia about your environment, constantly assessing for potential threats and danger. Dissociation is sort of the opposite of that. If hypervigilance is extreme alertness, then dissociation is like a lack of alertness. It refers to a strong disconnection between your senses, your environment, the people around you, and it typically winds up resulting in an extreme detachment from your day-to-day -day life. Depersonalization is a specific branch of dissociation, which specifically refers to the detachment of the self. Detachment from your memories, your thoughts, your body, your identity, everything that makes you, you. The best way I can describe it is just sort of like feeling like you don't belong to yourself. Like 
you've become so distant and faded and far away that you just can't reach yourself anymore. You don't know who you are now. You don't remember who you were before. It feels like you're not a real person. Although hypervigilance and dissociation are two very different types of trauma responses, I still exhibit both of them regularly. I typically experience hypervigilance when I'm in the environment where a past trauma previously took place, or when I'm experiencing the conditions or the buildup that led to a previous trauma. Like, for instance, whenever I hear any footsteps at all, my entire body tenses up and clenches into itself. I freeze, I stop breathing, and all at once I become hyper aware of every single sound that's around me. I experience the same response with other noises too, like the sound of keys jingling in a door, the sound of a garage opening, the sound of a doorbell ringing, the sound of a car pulling up, or worst of all, the sound of someone knocking, especially on my own door. However, in contrast with hypervigilance, I also experience dissociation, which gives me an almost unbelievable inability to pay attention to anything around me. When I'm in this state, my mind is just filled with numbness. I can't watch movies or YouTube videos, I can't read or play video games, I can't seem to focus on anything. I can barely even feel my own skin because it's like all of my senses are being muted. And intrusive thoughts are exactly what you think they are. They're hurtful, painful memories that keep popping into your head unwanted. For me, my brain kind of cycles through a fixed rotation of intrusive thoughts that just spin around in a wheel on loop. They often have a cascading effect where one bad memory bleeds into another, and before I know it, I spent the last three hours shuffling through a traumatic playlist on repeat. Now the good news about all this is that everything that I've just mentioned is extremely treatable. If you're suffering from PTSD, or even if you're not but you still exhibit some of the symptoms, you can absolutely receive help for these things and make them much more manageable. I'm not currently in therapy because I don't have health insurance, but I'm in the process of reading a book called The Body Keeps the Score by Bessel van der Kolk, and it has a lot of really helpful advice about how to heal from trauma and how to manage the more harmful symptoms. I highly recommend it for anyone who's struggling with this kind of thing. But, as lovely as it would be, this video is not an instructional tutorial about how to heal your trauma. This video is specifically about one particular source of trauma. See. Everyone knows that you can get trauma from abusive parents, from severe violence, from neglect, from assault, so on and so forth. I know that very well myself because a lot of the trauma that I harbor comes from violent experiences from my family and from my old schools. But there is a third source of my trauma that is so very real and very deep and very raw because I am still living through it even as I type out the script for this video. And that is the trauma of work. In this video, I'm going to be arguing that jobs, be they day jobs, career jobs, odd jobs, or what have you, are a primary source of trauma for many adults in the modern workforce. I've worked in the customer service industry since I was 17 years old, so that's about six years now. I've been a waitress, a hostess, a barista, a prep cook, a dishwasher, a deli worker, a cashier, a hospital kitchen worker, and a general fast food crew member. From ages 17 to 19, I worked part-time while being in school until I eventually dropped out and committed to full-time work. When I argue that work can cause trauma, I'm really arguing it in three different ways. One, I'm arguing that specific events within these jobs can be traumatic for employees, such as sexual harassment, abuse of co-workers, and so on. Two, I'm arguing that work, primarily work in the food service industry, creates an environment of perpetual, chronic trauma that can affect its employees over time. And three, I'm arguing that the nature of work itself, the nature of low-wage labor and the burden that it places on employees, is destined to foster trauma by its very design. This video will be pulling from various research sources, but most of it is going to be largely tied to my own experiences as a food service worker. So if anyone else has any other experiences with trauma in different fields, please feel free to share so in the comments. I'd love to read them. Part 1. Sexual Harassment this is going to be the shortest section because it's very personal and uncomfortable for me to talk about. Long story short, if you're a woman and you've worked in the customer service industry, you probably have a long list of stories you can share about experiences with sexual harassment. That's not to imply that men don't experience sexual harassment because of course they do, but I think it's fair to say that women are much more prone to experience it at higher rates and the power imbalance between men and women often makes the stakes a lot higher for us. In the six years that I've worked in the food industry, I have had men try to follow me home from work, had sexual comments made about my body by customers and coworkers, had to deal with unwanted flirting, had to deal with unwanted touching, and had a manager smack my ass. No, I'm not joking. Some of these events have affected me more deeply than others. For instance, the time when a man tried to follow me home was terrifying for me. I was 17, it was nighttime, and I was all alone. I didn't have anyone to turn to to ask for help. 
It absolutely traumatized me, and I think it was pretty much the starting point of where all my other work trauma began. Not only have I myself experienced harassment, but I've also been a witness to harassment happening to other women right in front of my eyes. I've literally had to form protective coalitions with other female coworkers in order to protect each other against male stalkers. We'd have systems where, if a known creep would walk into the store who was targeting a specific woman, then we'd have her hide in the back while the rest of us monitored him until he left the store. One time, one of my female coworkers, a young girl, was assaulted when walking into my job early in the morning. She quit shortly afterwards. Earlier in this video, I talked about hypervigilance, and I described it as being paranoid about your surroundings to an unhealthy degree, to the point where it starts to take over your life. But the funny thing about that is, if you're a woman who works in customer service, you kind of have to be hypervigilant in order to survive. You have to be paranoid and overly cautious around men. You have to be constantly observant and aware of your surroundings. The simple act of existing as a woman in the workplace means that you will be exposed to dangerous events on a regular basis. And whether or not those events become traumatic is based on a thousand and one different factors. But one of the most important factors in mitigating or preventing drama is whether or not the victim has a strong support system that will believe them and offer protection. And unfortunately, in my case, neither of those is usually true. All of the events that I've mentioned were horrible, both the ones that I've experienced and the ones that I've seen play out right in front of me. But if there's anything more nerve-wracking than sexual harassment itself, it might just be trying to ask for help about sexual harassment. The man who tried following me home from work was actually a regular customer at the store I was working at, and he was also a close friend of the owners. When I tried asking my manager for help about it, he told me that he was just a lonely old man who was just looking for a friend and that I needed to go easy on him. There was also a time when I tried talking to one of my coworkers about how another employee made gross comments about my body, but I was told that he didn't really mean it and that he was just joking around and that I needed to learn how to appreciate a compliment. I'm not going to give out too many personal details because I'm very paranoid about getting ducks, but my current job is at a run-of-the-mill fast food place, and even though I've only been working here for about half a year, I've already had lots of experiences with unwanted sexual comments, unwanted touching, being followed by men, so on and so forth. It makes me feel sick, and it makes me feel unsafe in my own body. But despite being made uncomfortable in a thousand and one different ways, past experiences have taught me that it's almost never actually worth it to try to talk about getting sexually harassed in the workplace. No one ever really believes you, no one ever really takes you seriously, and if you actually try to pursue action over it, then you wind up becoming an enemy to your coworkers, and people turn against you and treat you coldly. Anyways, yeah, sexual harassment is traumatic. On to the next chapter. Part 2 Physical trauma. When it comes to traumatic stress disorders, we usually only think of them in terms of interpersonal emotional relationships, like the abuse of a child by a parent or the assault of a student by a teacher. But isolated physical pain can be traumatic all on its own, even if it's not being directly caused by another person. In fact, this type of traumatic pain has its very own name. It's called cumulative trauma disorder. Cumulative trauma disorder, or CTD, is defined as the excessive wear and tear on muscles, tendons, and nerve tissue as a result of overuse of the body over an extended period of time. Cumulative trauma injuries commonly emerge in the form of conditions like arthritis, tendonitis, or carpal tunnel syndrome. Because I've worked in the food service industry for the past six years, I know firsthand about the wear and tear that your body can experience after working in stores and restaurants. One of the worst jobs I've ever had in my life was at a tiny little independent grocery store. Now, when we think of independent businesses, we usually characterize them as being charitable, good-natured, and much more benevolent than the corporate counterparts. But trust me, as someone who's worked for both small independent businesses and large corporate food chains, that tiny mom-and-pop store down the street from you does not treat its workers any better than a corporation. In fact, there's a decent chance that they actually treat them a lot worse. The thing about small independent businesses is that they're often so small that they're able to fly under the radar of U.S. labor laws and worker protection rights, meaning that they frequently employ more exploitative practices towards their employees because the owners know that they won't get caught. So at this tiny little grocery store that I worked at, full-time employees would get scheduled for five, eight to nine hour shifts a week with no breaks whatsoever. No 30 minute lunch, no 15s, no 10s, not even a five minute break. If you wanted any semblance of a break at all, you either took it when going to the bathroom or you took it when taking out the garbage, which is why emptying trash became my single favorite task, because it was my one chance to go outside and just breathe for a second. But at this job, it wasn't just that we were never given any breaks. It was specifically that we weren't allowed to sit down at all. And the most disgusting thing about this is that there was a chair in the store. In fact, there was a chair right beside the cash register. But employees could never sit in this chair because it belonged to the owner. 
and the owner could always tell if one of us had been sitting in it because there was a security camera right above us, and the cameras were hooked up to the owner's home so that he would watch us even when he wasn't in the store. But if he was in the store, then he'd do nothing but sit in the chair all day long, eating Kit Kats and Hershey bars, while the rest of us had to remain on our feet. I don't think I can fully put into words how dehumanizing it is to a know that you could never sit down even when you were in pain because someone was watching you at all times, and b to be taunted with the fact that your boss is sitting down right beside you, not doing any work whatsoever, all while you have to remain standing. This expectation of cashiers and service workers needing to stand for the entirety of a shift stems from the cultist belief that it is more professional to stand because sitting makes the employee look lazy. And this is of course rooted in the age-old customer service mantra that the customer is always right and that everything must be tailored around the customer at all times to maximize as much profit as possible. But despite being forced to stand for 9 hours a day without rest, that job actually wasn't the one that caused me any significant physical pain. The pain didn't start to appear until last year, when I spent 6 months working as a hospital kitchen worker. The shifts were standard, long hospital shifts, so you worked 12 to 13 hour days anywhere between 3 to 5 days a week, sometimes more if they were understaffed. Now, going in, I had been warned about the long shifts ahead of time, so I did what I could to prepare my body for it. I bought compression socks, I bought a nice sturdy pair of shoes, I made sure I did stretches every morning, just trying to do what I could to brace my body for what I knew was likely to be a difficult exertion. But looking back, there was really nothing I could do to prepare my body for what was about to come. First of all, I worked in a kitchen, and most kitchens have floor mats for the workers to stand on so that their feet are properly cushioned and so that foot strain isn't as bad. But this kitchen had no floor mats whatsoever except for a tiny one, which was so small and old and dirty that it barely offered any support whatsoever. Secondly, within these 12 hour shifts, you got at best one hour long break, maybe an hour and a half if you could sneak it in without the managers noticing. But of course, since I was a new employee, I almost never got the chance to sneak longer breaks because they were always watching me like a hawk. So you'd effectively be on your feet for 11 hours a day, with no floor mats to cushion your step, and a hot sweaty kitchen with hundreds and hundreds of meal tickets that you needed to plate each and every hour. Working this job caused me so much pain in my legs searing, agonizing pain. Pain so bad that it made both my feet swollen and red, and it caused me to start limping. I wound up needing to buy ankle braces, knee braces, and pain medication just to get through a single shift, but even that wasn't enough for me. I remember being very afraid each morning that I woke up because I knew of the pain that I'd be in by the end of the night. I knew that each step I took would only hurt more and more, and I knew that if it was a busy day, then I'd hardly get any chance for a break at all. And whenever I took my break, I would always go outside to lay flat on the benches, just trying to get some fresh air in my system and trying to give my whole body a rest. But it never worked because I'd be aching all over. And as the minutes of my break dwindled down, the truth is that I'd have to fight back tears because I knew that I'd have to get up in five minutes, finish up my remaining six hours, and grit my teeth through the rest of the pain. Eventually, I did wind up leaving the hospital for reasons going beyond just physical pain, but the damage that my body experienced during that time is still affecting me to this very day. I still have to wear ankle braces on both my feet whenever I'm at work, because if I don't, then I'll start limping halfway into my shift. I also used to be able to take long walks whenever I wanted to, and I can't do that anymore, because I'll start to feel pain after just a few minutes. And I'm not the only one who suffered from cumulative trauma injury. Over the past few years, I've witnessed dozens of my fellow co-workers develop severe back pain, severe foot pain, arthritis, tendinitis. I've witnessed people limp between registers and hunch their backs over grills to make food. I've seen this pain among all age groups, all the way from elderly co-workers to people my own age. Physical pain is a huge source of trauma for many people, be it trauma from one severe injury or a cumulative trauma from chronic pain that develops over time. And by forcing employees to stand for hours and hours with no real opportunities for rest and no proper support under their feet, jobs are directly responsible for causing trauma to their workers and are contributing to an epidemic of injured, damaged laborers that are just doing their best to survive. Part 3. Ableism Before I ever knew I was autistic, I had already unknowingly adopted a very common autistic practice, the act of masking. Autistic masking is when an autistic person adopts the behaviors and characteristics of neurotypical people in order to blend in, thus masking the more natural behaviors which are often deemed as strange or uncomfortable by non-autistic people. Masking takes a lot of effort and energy. 
For one, the simple ability to mask requires an understanding of how to seem normal, and learning how to do that requires studying and observing the behaviors of others. But masking is also difficult because masking is an act of suppression. It's suppressing your natural personality, your natural inclinations, and your natural urges, all for the sake of being able to properly mesh into society. It's hard, it's stressful, and it's work. Masking is tied with another work requirement that almost all workers in the customer service industry are forced to undergo. That work requirement is something known as emotional labor. So if you have a Twitter account, you've probably heard this phrase used quite a bit over these past few years. Twitter is notorious for taking certain psychological phrases and watering them down beyond belief, to the point where their original definition is almost unrecognizable. So no judgment, but in case you weren't aware, Emotional labor is not when you have to listen to and comfort one of your friends who's in a crisis, and emotional labor is also not when a girlfriend is comforting her crying boyfriend. These are not acts of emotional labor, that's just called being a good person. The term emotional labor was coined by a sociologist named Arlie Hochschild in her 1983 book titled The Managed Heart, Commercialization of Human Feeling. Hochschild defines emotional labor as labor that requires one to induce or suppress feeling in order to sustain the outward countenance that produces a proper state of mind in others, in this case, the sense of being cared for in a convivial and safe place. In simpler words, emotional labor is when service workers have to perform the work of outwardly seeming passionate and grateful about the customers and the job itself. Hochschild outlines emotional labor as having two different elements, the first element being the service worker's management of their own emotions to ensure that they're smiling, cheerful, energetic, and so on, but the second element is the service worker's management of the customer's emotions. Managing a customer's emotions goes beyond just making them happy. It also involves grappling with whatever negative emotions the customer could be feeling at any given moment. Sometimes customers are annoyed, sometimes they're angry, sometimes they're outright violent. And as a service worker, it's your job to deal with whatever disposition or temperament your customer has when they step through your door. Now, I'm going to swing this back to autism. I already talked about how masking is something that autistic people have to do in order to fit into society, but masking within the service industry is 10 times more difficult because autistic service workers have to perform the act of masking in tandem with emotional labor. This means that autistic workers have to employ two layers of suppression, the suppression of their natural stimming urges along with other common autistic behaviors, and the suppression of their natural thoughts and emotions when working for businesses and customers. Again, the two elements of emotional labor are managing your emotions and managing the customer's emotions. But for autistic people, the act of managing someone else's emotions can be incredibly difficult. Now, I don't want to generalize at all because not all autistic people are the same. Some autistic people thrive in social environments and have barely any issues with customer service whatsoever. But something that I know a lot of autistic people struggle with, myself included, is being able to recognize what someone else is or isn't feeling. We struggle with being able to identify other people's emotions and whether or not we've affected them. There are many unspoken rules within social environments, and some of those rules carry the expectation that you need to be capable of recognizing the other person's thoughts and intentions without them directly telling you. So as autistic people, we carry with us a sense of worry and paranoia over whether or not we're misinterpreting someone or misreading intention or mixing up body language. It's not so much that autistic people don't understand social interaction, it's more like a single social interaction can have like three or four different potential readings or interpretations, and if we pick the wrong interpretation, then it can wind up blowing up in our faces. Now, carrying the stress and confusion in casual social settings is bad enough, but autistic service workers have to contend with this confusion in a job environment, and they are forced to do so under the watchful eye of management, who are often observing and scrutinizing their every move. In the service industry, the consequences of failing at social interaction go beyond just mere embarrassment. Each social interaction carries the potential threat of being criticized or reprimanded or even fired if you fail to do your job properly. So for autistic workers, this means that the second step of emotional labor suddenly becomes 10 times more difficult. Managing a customer's emotions requires you being able to both anticipate and identify when a customer is upset, often without them directly telling you how they feel. But if you struggle with nonverbal communication or social interaction in general, then this is something that you are going to fail at a lot. Trust me, I know from experience. But okay, this is all well and good, but what exactly does any of this have to do with trauma? Surely, being socially awkward isn't such a severe phenomenon that it can be traumatic, right? Well, unfortunately, it can be. 
So far in this video, we've talked about two different types of trauma. We've discussed the most widely recognizable trauma, trauma that occurs from a single terrifying event, and we've also discussed a form of physical trauma, CTDs. So now we're going to introduce a third type of trauma, something known as microtrauma. Now, using the words micro and trauma together in a sentence might seem oxymoronic, since the very definition of trauma states that its parameters must be terrible or severe, and the word micro seems like a direct contradiction to that set of requirements. But in order to navigate through this contradiction, allow me to introduce the writings of an author and psychiatrist named Margaret Krasnopal. Krasnopal popularized the phrase microtrauma in her 2015 book titled Microtrauma, a Psychoanalytic Understanding of Cumulative Psychic Injury. In her book, she argues that trauma as a concept can largely be split into two categories, macro and micro. Macro trauma is exactly as we understand it, severe, overt, obvious, and alarming. Whereas micro trauma is the opposite, subtle, covert, imperceptible, and dismissible. Whereas examples of macro trauma are extreme things like physical abuse and sexual assault, micro traumatic events are much more, well, micro. Their situations like being mocked by friends or being scolded by family. In an isolated vacuum, most people would agree that macro-traumatic events are more likely to cause a victim severe traumatic stress than micro-events. But Krasnopol explains that the danger of a microtrauma is not in its isolated occurrence. The dangers of microtraumas emerge in environments when a person is most likely to experience them repeatedly over a long period of time. She writes, these subtler occurrences, especially in the aggregate, can create psychic bruises that are hard to notice and harder to minister to, with the consequence that they accumulate invisibly. The result is a psychic bruising that builds imperceptibly over time, little by little eroding a person's self-worth and well-being. There is already a strong stigma against mental illness to begin with, but when someone is suffering from repeated microtraumas, they will often be hesitant to ever seek help because of the likelihood that someone will tell them that they're too sensitive or that they're blowing things out of proportion. The outcome of that reluctance is that victims of microtraumas wind up suffering in silence, allowing the pain of repeated insults and cruelty to slowly mount over time. In other words, it's death by a thousand cuts. To bring this back to autism, autistic people and neurodivergent people in general are regularly subjected to microtraumas within the workplace. Being autistic means that we often struggle with the common things that neurotypical people don't struggle with, and as a result, we get patronized, condescended to, degraded, and sometimes outright insulted. Ableism in the workplace is a major source of trauma for autistic and disabled people, both because of cruel treatment from others and because of the sheer strain of labor that is required for us to be able to function optimally in social settings. Part 4. Racism I have experienced racism at pretty much every job I've ever worked at. For instance, I've had a white woman accuse me of stealing money from her and threaten to call the cops on me, had a white manager tell me to watch some black kids who she thought were stealing, had a white manager make a 9-11 joke at me after I explained that my father's side of the family is Muslim, had a gay white coworker constantly turn on a sassy black woman accent around me, this same gay white coworker would see the African head wraps I'd wear and would demand that I either buy one for him or gift him one of my own, I've had to serve police officers who would constantly trash Black Lives Matter in front of my face, I've had one of my store owners go on random racist tirades about slavery and protests in Kyle Rittenhouse, and I've had an Asian co-worker do the Wakanda forever salute every time she saw me. Okay, so when I say that last one, and probably a few others on this list, I can anticipate what a lot of people's reactions are going to be, especially from other black people in my audience. A lot of people are going to be like, she did Wakanda forever every time she saw you? Did you slap her? And no, I didn't. Nor did I call out any of my racist white co-workers who went on rants about Black Lives Matter. Nor did I tell off that gay guy who always turned up his black center on me and demanded that I buy him an African head wrap. I didn't stand up for myself in any of these scenarios, and I know that that's going to make a lot of people angry. And honestly, I don't blame you at all for being angry at me because I'm angry at myself, too. The truth is, I don't usually defend myself or my dignity in these types of situations because the truth is... Whenever I experience stuff like this, I freeze. My body freezes, my mind freezes, my thoughts go blank, I try to speak but words don't come out. In these types of moments, I'm very, very afraid. And even in less overtly threatening scenarios, like when that gay guy would always try to sound black around me, it's like, yeah, that's not really a life or death situation, but it would still make me deeply, intrinsically uncomfortable. And even though I knew that I needed to stand up for myself, even though I knew that I needed to tell him to stop disrespecting me, I didn't. Because instead, I just froze. 
A very common set of trauma responses is one that you've probably heard of before. It's known as fight, flight, freeze, or fawn. Any person who's experienced trauma will typically have involuntarily developed one of these trauma responses without even realizing it. For me, for as long as I can remember, my trauma response has always been to freeze up, to stifle my breathing, to clench my muscles together, and for my words to get choked up and strangled in my throat. I don't like that this is my response, and I hope that I can change it in the future so that I can be more proactive in situations like this, but this trauma response is the reason why I have almost never defended myself in situations where I experience racism, because in those moments, I become afraid and I freeze up. And to be honest, I know that a lot of other black people experience the freeze reaction as well in response to racism, and I have nothing but empathy and compassion for them. A couple years ago, there was a clip going around the internet of a black woman having her frill felt up by a group of white people, and I remember the indignation that a lot of black Twitter had at the time towards her. I remember a lot of people calling her spineless, calling her weak, and a few people even calling her pathetic for not telling them to stop. But I completely understood her, because I knew with 100% certainty that if I were in that exact same situation as her, that I would have frozen up too. And the worst part of this is that in the video, you can see that she's smiling, and I remember people accusing her of liking that they were touching her. But I know that smile. That's a nervous smile. That's an involuntary smile that you do when you're stressed and overwhelmed. I have had that smile many, many different times in the service industry. But it's interesting because I am referencing this video as an instance of racism, and it absolutely is racist. They're literally petting her hair like she's a zoo animal. But it's funny that I use this example because I know that there are going to be some white people watching this who don't see anything wrong with it. They're like, it's not a big deal. You're blowing things out of proportion. You're making a mountain out of a molehill. It's just a minor thing. And this is where we introduce our next term, the phrase microaggression. The term microaggression was coined by Harvard psychiatrist Chester Pierce in the 1970s. Dr. Pierce was an educated black man who'd spent a lot of his life in proximity to upper-class white people, and that proximity to wealth and education and status would lead people to believe that he wouldn't have experienced that much racism because clearly he was around educated white people who knew better, right? But Pierce understood that that wasn't the case. He understood that racism exists among all age groups and across all income levels. Microaggressions can happen to many different minority groups, but Pierce specifically described racial microaggressions as black and white racial interactions that are characterized by white put-downs done in an automatic, pre-conscious, or unconscious fashion. A lot of the racist experiences that I previously listed can hopefully be agreed upon by most people as being overtly racist, like when that white woman accused me of stealing from her. But a good chunk of the racism that I've experienced in the workplace wasn't very overt at all. It's a kind that would fall under the category of a microaggression. For instance, I've had white coworkers dote and obsess over my big hoop earrings, saying that I look fierce in them, had white customers compliment my African head wrap and use it as a prompt to ask where I'm from, had white coworkers say that I look more beautiful with my natural hair out instead of when it's wrapped up, had white women compliment my skin by saying black don't crack, and had white women compliment my ass and say that they were jealous of black women for being naturally curvy. To an unaware person, it might seem like there's nothing wrong with any of these experiences on a surface level. In fact, these are all overtly compliments, and being complimented is a good thing, right? But the experience of hearing these comments as a black woman is extremely uncomfortable. For one, having white women make sexual comments about my body is never okay, even if they intended it to be in a complimentary fashion. But also, these interactions are inherently alienating and othering. They're acts of objectification, and experiencing them can be humiliating. Microaggressions aren't just annoying or frustrating comments that you complain about with your friends. They have the capacity to do real, long-term damage to a person's psyche and self-esteem. In fact, John Head, author of the book Black Men in Depression, devoted an entire chapter of his book to the topic of how racism directly correlates with and perpetuates depression in black men, particularly focusing on the effects of racist microaggressions. He argues that microaggressions are so frequent in the lives of black people that they slowly erode and wear down our will to exist. They lead to depression, low self-esteem, anxiety, and, key word here, trauma. Microaggressions are a type of microtrauma. They are traumas that are deliberately tied to race, but they carry with them the caveat that they won't be taken seriously, and because they won't be taken seriously, they leave the victim with a perpetual sense of self-doubt and anxiety, not being able to fully express why they were made to feel so uncomfortable and unsafe. And if a black person is frequently inundated with microaggressions on a regular basis, then those feelings of unsafety will deepen and deepen until they're made to feel unsafe in their own place of work. While we're on the topic of race and trauma, and since this video is all about trauma, 
I would be remiss if I didn't take a moment to discuss a very important phrase. That phrase is post-traumatic slave syndrome. The concept of post-traumatic slave syndrome, or PTSS, was popularized by a woman named Joy DeGruel in her 2005 book of the same name. She characterizes PTSS as being a psychological condition of multi-generational trauma resulting from centuries of slavery, continued oppression, and institutional racism today. In the book, she argues that the symptoms that are laid out for victims of PTSD, heightened fear and paranoia, intense psychological distress, feelings of detachment or estrangement from others, are all symptoms that Black Americans regularly experience on a day-to-day -day basis. This argument, that the trauma symptoms of PTSD victims can be directly linked with the long-term effects of racism in Black people, is corroborated when you look at the core generational trauma that exists within the Black community. I want to take a moment to reference Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. In his letter from Birmingham City Jail, he describes in heartbreaking detail the humiliation and suffering that he felt while witnessing the oppression of Black people in the Civil Rights era, along with the pain that he harbored when having to teach his children about racism. He writes, When you're harried by the day and haunted by night, by the fact that you are a Negro, living constantly at a tiptoe stance, never knowing what to expect next, and plagued with inner fears and outer resentments, when you are forever fighting a degenerating sense of nobodiness, then you will understand why we find it difficult to wait. A lot of things stand out to me in this passage. First, and most harrowingly, is Dr. King's usage of the phrase, degenerating sense of nobodiness. To me, this is a perfect description of depersonalization, the sense of losing yourself, of losing your thoughts and memories and dreams and identity, of losing what makes you who you are. Racism, in essence, is designed to dehumanize the victim, to strip them of their humanity and to leave them feeling hollow and lifeless. And the reaction that I have when I freeze and go numb in the middle of a racist encounter, when my mind is blank and I can barely react to what's happening around me, that trauma response is extremely similar to how I feel when I'm dissociating. But in the same passage, Dr. King also speaks of living in a constant tiptoe stance plagued with inner fears and outer resentments. Now this, to me, seems extremely indicative of hypervigilance, of constantly being on edge, of being afraid and paranoid, and of always scanning your environment for danger. And it's ironic, because most psychiatrists try to reduce hypervigilance in trauma victims by treating the victim directly and by teaching them coping skills or giving them medication to lower their sense of anxiety. But the difference between general hypervigilance and racial hypervigilance is that racial hypervigilance among black people is often completely necessary. It's a justified paranoia that we've been forced to develop in order to keep ourselves alive. Racial trauma is something that all people of color are subjected to within the workplace, and whether it's done in the form of an overt racist attack or a subtle microaggression, it's still painful and dehumanizing either way. Part 5. The Nature of Work Okay, so listen. I am not the most well-read person in the world when it comes to socialist theory. I've never read Engels, I've never read Hegel, I've never read Kant, I don't know the full extensive play-by-play -play -play history of the French Revolution or the Bolshevik Revolution. What I am is a working class person who's been working in the customer service industry for the last six years of my life. I may not know enough about the economy to be able to confidently call myself a socialist or a communist, but I know what it's like to work under capitalism, and I know what exploitation is because I've experienced it directly. When people think of fast food workers, they usually think of young teenagers or they think of lazy adults who just didn't try hard enough to apply themselves in life. People think fast food jobs are easy, that all it is is flipping burgers and ringing up orders. But as someone who's worked in pretty much every type of restaurant, all the way from fine dining to indie cafes to mom and pop shacks to fast food, believe me when I say, there is no such thing as an easy service job. All jobs are hard. All food jobs are hard. Some of them are easier than others, sure, but all of them carry the inherent difficulty and strain of labor. First is the emotional labor, which we already covered in the ableism section. But there's also literal physical labor, the labor of emptying food trucks and carrying heavy boxes and bending over a grill or a counter to make food. There's mental labor, the mental aspect of memorizing meal recipes and specializations and of needing to hold in your mind the orders of 10 different tables all at once. There's also the unspoken requirement that all of these jobs demand endurance, the physical endurance to be able to stand for 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 hours a day in a hot, sweaty kitchen, sometimes with barely any chance for a break. 
the emotional endurance to be able to withstand the constant barrage of harassment that you're subjected to on a daily basis, not just from customers, but also from your own crew members. The mental endurance of having to take hundreds and hundreds of orders a day and of needing to stay conscious enough to not make any mistakes or screw-ups. There is no such thing as unskilled labor, but if there were, it certainly wouldn't be found in the customer service industry. The very definition of exploitation is to treat someone poorly and to take advantage of them and their resources for your own gain. By extension, worker exploitation is when workers are abused, when workers are taken advantage of, and when workers' resources are siphoned from them in order to extract value for the company. There are many ways in which worker exploitation manifests, some of them obvious and some of them not. One of the most vivid examples of worker exploitation is one that I've outlined in this very video, forcing your employees to work 8-hour shifts without a lunch break, and forcing them to stand without a chance to sit. This is done because owners and companies want to extract as much productivity out of their employees as possible without allowing them the chance to rest or recuperate. But worker exploitation also exists on a fundamental level throughout the service industry, and the most obvious way of describing it is to simply point out that most service workers are living in poverty. Although we've seen that in the midst of the COVID era that companies are more than capable of raising their wages, for the past several decades, most food workers have barely made above minimum wage for their work. In fact, the vast majority of jobs that I've worked in my life haven't even paid above $9 an hour. And although more and more fast food places are raising their wages to $12 or $15 an hour and are congratulating themselves and patting themselves on the back for it, if we lived in a country that actually cared about its citizens, and if the minimum wage had properly risen to match inflation and the cost of living, then the average wage of service workers would actually be closer to $25 an hour. Because service workers receive such a low wage, they are often forced to work multiple jobs just to make ends meet. This means that they have little time to be able to pursue college or trade school or apprenticeships or anything that might be able to help them enter higher paying fields, so they get trapped in a cycle of low wage work that is extremely difficult to climb out of. This also means that service workers remain perpetually stuck in survival mode in two different ways. One is the financial survival mode they're in, where they have to work tirelessly to make ends meet. And the second survival mode is their psychological mind state, where they're fighting to survive the cruel and abusive conditions of their jobs. Food workers are also taken advantage of by the sheer amount of responsibilities that they're often saddled with. My first few jobs were at smaller independent businesses with barely any people on staff, so this meant that when I got hired at one of these jobs, I'd have to take on roles that realistically should have been divided out to multiple people. So in one restaurant alone, I had to be a server, a dishwasher, a cashier, a janitor, a prep cook, a baker, and a manager. I occupied at least seven different jobs, but I was still only paid the wage of a single employee, $8 an hour. This means that owners get the benefits of saving money by paying low wages to their employees that are taking on the brunt of the work. When I worked at the hospital, I worked on a literal assembly line where I had to put food on a plate and slide it down to the next worker. I did this process for every plate at least 700 times a day for 12 to 13 hours a day. I performed my task in the middle of a sweltering kitchen with aching, agonizing feet and while enduring a constant barrage of harassment and yelling from my coworkers. I was an instrument. I was a machine. I was a cog in the production of a literal assembly line. And for that job, the worst job of my life, I was paid $13 an hour. And you know what? I remember being grateful for that amount of money because it was the highest wage that I'd ever received in my entire life. I have read a little bit of Marx, and the one thing that I remember reading that really resonated with me was his concept of worker alienation. He argues that worker alienation is produced through the estrangement of workers from their sense of humanity. When a worker is forced to labor for 12 hours a day for a disrespectfully low wage, they become severed from the value of their own work, because their true value isn't being properly compensated for. And so I was reading this, and I just became fixated on the phrase, alienation, alienation from your value, alienation from the human spirit, alienation from the self. I have talked so much about identity in this video, specifically about the loss of identity. I've talked about worker alienation, racial dehumanization, dissociation, and depersonalization. And all of these terms tie back to a core outcome of trauma, the violent disconnection from the self the tragic loss of who you are. And when I return to Annie Lee's Blue Monday, a depiction of a black woman exhausted and forlorn based on her own negative experiences with work, I look at her expressionless face with no eyes and no nose and no lips tilted down and away from the audience. I look at her and I see loss. I see that she has lost herself to the endless grind and toil and suffering of work.
Back in 2018, I spent a year working at a shitty fast food place. I remember at the time, I was scheduled to work morning shifts, and at this place, the morning shift started at 4.30 a.m. So I remember waking up at 3 in the morning every morning just to get ready for work. And I remember every day I'd start my shift, and I just feel this crushing dissociation just numb all over, barely being able to speak, barely being able to concentrate, barely being able to exist. I remember when I'd stand at the cash register and try with every fiber of my being to force on a smile because a district manager was standing in the corner and was watching me and rating my performance on a checkboard. I remember the constant barrage of microaggressions I'd get from customers and coworkers. I remember my body being commented on in ways that made me feel unsafe. And I remember getting insulted and made fun of for needing to have things repeated to me in order to understand them. I remember crawling into bed every single night and sobbing into my pillow because I couldn't bear to face the next day. But the thing that scarred me the most about this job is that I learned that I was not the only one experiencing this pain. I learned over time that almost every single one of my coworkers would cry on their lunch break. One person would cry in the bathroom, another would cry in her car, and another would cry in the storage area. And those who were willing to talk to me about it would repeat back to me the exact same misery that I was experiencing, the misery of stress and exhaustion and terror. Every single job that I've ever had in my life has been a job where I wake up terrified. I wake up terrified of being touched and groped by men who don't respect my body. I wake up terrified of being yelled at, screamed at, and cussed at for being slow to understand basic concepts. I wake up terrified of being abused by white customers, of being forced to serve police officers who don't respect my existence, of being forced to work for white men who say to my face that slavery was my own people's fault. I wake up terrified of the throbbing pain that I know my feet will be in by the end of the day. All across the country and all across the world, there are underpaid and overworked employees who are facing horrible trauma in the midst of their industries. Whether it's assault-based trauma, gender-based trauma, racial trauma, or any kind of trauma, workers are being inundated with environments that persistently expose them to traumatic forms of harassment, bigotry, and pain. We give our lives to these jobs. We trade in our youth, our health, and our very spirit. But in return, we get crumbs for wages, hardly any benefits, and the constant evidence that we are not as valued as the profit that we generate. And this is by design. This is the nature of capitalism. There will always have to be people at the bottom of the ladder. There will always have to be people who are getting exploited in order for the people at the top to thrive. Excessive wealth is not generated by hard work or by pulling yourself up by the bootstraps. It's generated by denying workers their humanity, by treating them like machines and by extracting as much value from them as is physically possible and then extracting even more on top of that. We started this pandemic with people praising essential workers and calling them heroes, but it's clear that this country, and this world at large, does not value the people who keep it running. Part 6. Returning. When I cry at night after I get home from work, I am crying because I cannot reach myself. I feel stripped to the bone, as if I have nothing left of me remaining, as if my body and mind and soul are lost and have been lost for a very, very long time. And this loss that I carry leaves me feeling numb and lifeless. It leaves me feeling like the black woman in Annie Lee's Blue Monday painting, a woman with no eyes to see out of and no mouth to speak through, a woman shrouded in a blue that is overwhelming her, who was burdened and beaten down by a system that couldn't care less whether she lives or dies. But then I think of Annie Lee herself, and I think of how every night when she got home from her miserable job, she might have cried, and she might have felt burdened by the weight of her responsibilities, but she did not stay defeated, because every night, when she got home from work, she painted. She used art as a refuge for her soul, to give her something tangible to hold on to so that she wouldn't be lost to the misery and dread of her experiences. When I make art, it doesn't exactly feel like a refuge all the time. It doesn't feel like I'm being saved or like painting is my salvation. In fact, Oftentimes, art and writing are further sources of stress and anxiety for me, but I've spent the past two months working on this video, and I've worked on it in the midst of experiencing sexual harassment at my job, the kind that just makes me want to curl into myself and die. But what I've found through sitting down to paint or write or record or edit every day is that art has wound up serving as a kind of an anchor for me. When I find myself slipping away, when I find myself getting lost in the numbness, I found that I can reach for my paintbrush and use it as a lifeline to keep myself from drowning. And I never met Miss Annie Lee. 
I have no idea if she experienced dissociation or if she used art as a tool to help cope with mental illness. But they say that art is like telepathy, that its greatest power is in being able to transcend time and space, so that a painter who died 10 years ago can still speak and communicate through her art, and can touch the heart of a person who she's never met, even long after she's passed. And through her painting, I feel a kind of a kinship with Miss Annie Lee. I feel like she's reaching through time to hold me, and is giving me warmth and closure, and is telling me that everything's gonna be okay. So, maybe I can follow her example, and continue painting, continue making art, and maybe after I've made enough art, maybe one day I'll be able to wake up without feeling so terrified. Thanks for watching, and keep doing your best.